you put up with so much and then you've had enough and then what have you got? You've got a strike, haven't you? You've no other way. You've got to demonstrate. Well, we thought it was pretty clear, really, that there was good and evil. It's only later in your life you discover, actually, it's not quite as simple as that. I began to find myself getting more and more bolshy and talking more as I was wearing a cloth cap and standing in the car park at British Leyland. Without a union, we wouldn't have had a leg no. to stand on. Scratch the surface of anyone over 35 and you'll probably find a striker. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, striking was something millions of us did. We came to striking for all kinds of reasons. And some of the most surprising people were strikers. I didn't start off as a supporter of um, industrial action. I started off as a supporter of sweet reason, um, as I saw it. <laughs> Norman Tebbit became the trade unionist's bogeyman when he was in government, but in the 1960s he was a pilot at BOAC and a union activist. Fasten your seatbelts, ready for takeoff. Thank you. And when we introduced the 707, for example, the management was so poor at its own job that eventually it fell to myself and another co pilot to show the management how to schedule the crews. If the captain wants a cup of coffee, they serve it on the flight deck. And there are always plenty of empties here too. So there we were, two ordinary guys, doing the work which should have been done by the management. I was beginning to get slightly bolshy by then. <laughs> How does the staff feel about this dispute? Well, of course, we're all very concerned. I need hardly tell you. Like most of the pilots, the trade union reformer was ready to strike. But first, he just worked to rule guy comes out with a flight plan and you just say, no, I'm terribly sorry, old boy, but that's not right. Not going to sign that. And leave him to find out what the mistake is. It's, a, it's an awful way to behave. You know, it just, it just rubs and it's unpleasant. But that was our minimum response, you know, to indicate to the management we were getting quite serious. It started when I was quite young. You know, I organised industrial action amongst the paper boys when I was the paper boy, you know. Former BBC Director General Greg Dyke continued to lead industrial action when he became a trainee newspaper hack. That was the sort of person I was. I always thought you could, you know, I railed against everything, wanted to change everything. I organised for all the journalists across the group, I don't know, about 60, all came to one meeting with the managing director, the managing director, and there was nobody above about 21. And the managing director looked at us and said, look, there's no point giving you more money, because you'll only spend it on things like portable radios. It was like peer pressure, you know. Um, I remember Paul McCartney once said that he took drugs because of peer pressure, and yet he was a Beatle. Eddie Shaw would be besieged by mass pickets at his Warrington Printing Works in 1983. Back in 1970, Shaw was besieging Granada TV as a striking floor manager. But that was under duress. When the person next to you looks at the person next to him and he says yes, and they all say yes, like sort of dominoes in the line, you just stick your hand up as well. You know, and I, to be honest with you, most of us really didn't worry about what was right or wrong. This night in the pub at Wurzborough was the first time his wife Anne had allowed herself to be filmed with Arthur. Anne Scargill, ex-wife of NUM leader Arthur Scargill, was used to the fallout from strikes. She's seen stories criticising her 15-year-old daughter for going to upper-class events like Jim Carner's. There was right-wing uproar when her husband appeared in a new Volvo car. So they said, ah, what a story. Mrs. <laughs> but surprisingly, Crosses Anne only came to the picket line when the miners were striking against pit closures in 1984. Before the miners' strike, I just went to work. I had a daughter. 
Arthur's dad lived with us. And then in 1984, all hell broke loose, not only with me, but with all the other women. I should have, definitely should have, voted against. That was a lack of courage on my part, frankly. As editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie would be a staunch opponent of strikes. But three years before he led the paper, he found himself striking against it. It would have been impossible to cross the picket line. I, I neither had the courage, nor, by the way, would the management have welcomed me with open arms. What was I going to do? If I'd gone in there and sat down, it would just have been a way of earning money for doing nothing because the printers would have blacked my output and would never have handled it anyway. Printers sitting back there, oh, bloody lovely, this. More strikes, the better, sir. Right? So there was, I wouldn't have achieved anything by crossing the picket line. Actually, I don't regret that. You can't really call the DHSS industry. It's like a farce. I mean, it was, a, <laughs> it was um, just like 14,000 people shuffling bits of paper, waiting for them to invent computers, basically. Viz comic editor Chris Donald was surprised to find he was on strike because no one in his union had told him. All we knew about it was that the, the boss said, oh, by the way, there's this strike thing tomorrow, you don't have to come in. So we went, OK, so we didn't come in. They were quite happy for you to not come in and then come back a day later. They didn't want people sort of going and, and um, standing next to braziers and calling people scabs and things like that. So striking sucked in some surprising people. There are many reasons why people strike. All those in favour, please show. <laughs> but at the heart of most strikes, there's usually a grievance. None of the girls got any doubts at all. We know what we're fighting for we and we're prepared to stay there till we get it. Yes. Women don't make a habit of coming out on strike for nothing. Ford's Dagenham plant in 1968. The women's reason for going on strike? Sex discrimination. The Trade Union Congress and the Labour Party are on record for equal pay for women. They made car seats and were classed as less skilled than men doing the same work. They were also on a special, lower, women's pay rate. It's wake-up time, isn't it? You're working and you're thinking, I should be getting more for this because it's seat, it's a skill. So it's wake-up time. Eileen Pullen and Vera Syme will rub shoulders with politicians to highlight their grievance. They were sweeping the Air floor. Grading. They got the same grade yeah. as what we did. The sweeper couldn't get onto a machine, but we could do the cleaning. It's right, isn't That's it? right, yeah, yeah. Because that's the only way you got anywhere with yeah. Forge. You had to strike, didn't you? Yeah. Unfortunately. Sheila Douglas and Gwen Davis also worked in the upholstery shop. It was always men's uh, yes. problems that were being fought over, not <laughs> ours. Football was rocked by a one-man strike in the 1960s. The reason? Contracts that would make some of today's overpaid stars blanch. It was a slavery contract. If they want you, they you're obliged to sign the contract. And if you don't, they don't even have to pay you. They didn't even have to give you the £20 a week. Newcastle United star George Eastham's contract meant he earned little and couldn't move without the club's say-so. All footballers were on the same deal, but Newcastle's star striker was ready to go on strike. If you believe in something firmly and they're prepared to do something about it, then you must do it. Public sector manual workers were angered by a government pay ceiling of 5% in 1979. They staged a series of strikes in the winter of discontent. What's your normal jobs? We're both administrators. So what does that mean? <laughs> it was inevitable that it was going to happen. The government knew it was going to happen. 
Ian Lowe's led the Liverpool gravedigger strike. Their reason? Working in Dickensian conditions for low pay. A fellow would travel round on a, a dumper truck with a tea in a can and would pass it on to the two gravediggers um, who were still down the grave eating sandwiches covered in dirt. Those people worked under appalling conditions and were treated with contempt by the employer and uh, they'd had enough, quite frankly. I'm asking you to support the Joint Shop Stewards' recommendation. There were almost 12 strikes a week at one British Leyland plant in the late 1960s. Many of Leyland's walkouts were caused by its pay system. All the workforce were organised into gangs. Your world was dominated by the politics of that gang in relationship to the rest of the factory. Shop steward Bill Lancaster called a spontaneous wildcat strike without union backing. The reason? His gang was paid less than another gang. We just said to the foreman, how much are we getting for this? And we were told, and we just said, right, that's it. And we just walked out and brought the whole place to a standstill for three days. I guess, looking back at hindsight, I should have felt guilty, but I didn't, because everybody else was doing it. It was, you know, it was, it was an incredible atmosphere to work in. Whether the individual agreed or not, sometimes they had little choice about striking. The closed shop meant you had to be a union member to work, break the strike, and you could be out of the union and your job. And we'd often have a meeting once a week and we'd all sit into some left-winger sort of yelling and screaming and we'd all sit there nodding and thinking, you know, how much longer is he going to go on for? And then we'd all go. And it was a senseless thing to me because we were fighting for a small percentage increase, which would take us years to pull back. I think we were out for about three or four weeks. You're still staying out? Yeah. You're not going back at all? No, no, no. How strong was the feeling at the meeting this morning? Very strong. 100%. 100%. There are many reasons for striking, although they're not always obvious to everyone. What we came out for, I think, it was for something the electricians were complaining about. And we were out and they were in. <laughs> and we was astonished. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, British workers embarked on one of the country's most intense periods of strike action. The Snatch Squad moved in. Almost 8 million working days were lost on average each year due to strikes. 